Okay, so we've just been talking about how many mm -hmm. different mutations mm -hmm. are available mm -hmm. and the fact that we all have a bunch of them that put us not mm -hmm. quite at the optimum mm -hmm. necessarily, but people are pretty healthy nonetheless. So one thing I take from this mm -hmm. is that a lot of these mutations don't really do all that much bad to us. And then my next question is, so if that's the case, how does natural selection get rid of them? How does natural selection get rid of them? Um, in some cases, it simply doesn't, right? Because, and, and we know that it doesn't because they're there. Natural selection would have gotten rid of them if they were really bad. Mm -hmm. Now, there's still, there's still a mutation rate, so the new ones arise all the time, and old ones are gradually eliminated, and the, the, the best thought about how they are eventually eliminated is not because they individually have a bad effect, but because in different combinations, they can, syner they can have a synergistic effect on a system, for instance. So this that one tiny bit bad, this one tiny bit bad, two of them together. Two of them really, really bad. bad, and then they both will get eliminated. Um, but so that's a very powerful idea, actually, about how natural mm -hmm. selection actually works. It's not this single gene model that we always are told to calculate. Right. And it's not mm -hmm. just even two genes, it's how many? And it's not even two genes. It's very, you know, many of these systems you know, would require three or four or five or six hits, if you will, six particular combinations of these mutations that would now be, now, now be deleterious enough that they would be eliminated by And then they're all wiped selection. out at once. And then in that individual, they're all wiped out at once because that individual will not survive. So there's this general principle in genetics that it takes one genetic death of someone who either dies or never mm -hmm. reproduces to eliminate a single new mutation. Correct. And given that we each are coming up with how many new mutations in each individual? All the time. Um, 10 new mutations, something like that? Yeah. Um, there's this mystery, and I think what you proposed is a main part of the answer. Yeah, so, so what has happened is there are so many of these mutations, they're so diverse, but they have to come together in an in individual in particular combinations, and the probability of them coming together is relatively small because they're still individually somewhat rare. Right. And um, so the likelihood that you will happen to have five of these particularly inconvenient mutations coming mm -hmm. together in you is small enough. But it probably accounts for you know, quite a few birth defects, stillbirths, you know, spontaneous abortions, things like that, in, in mm -hmm. human populations at least. Are you worried about the human genome and maintaining its integrity, given that almost everybody can reproduce now and live for quite a long time? Well, we live a long time, but we were still reproducing at, at a young age. So there are people who say evolution <laughs> stopped for humans because they note that hardly anybody is dying, but that's not what makes it work, is it? No. no it what, what makes it work? No, because the, the, the way of the evolution works by uh, counting your contribution to the next generation. Uh, and our contributions to the next generation happen in our 20s and 30s, typically. And it doesn't really matter how old we get. We mostly get in the way of our offspring by you know, consuming resources and things like that, but it doesn't really affect Some of our us contribute to our offspring one way or another. We, we, well, we would like to think so in, 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 in sometimes financial and social ways, uh, but not in genetic ways, not in evolutionarily relevant ways. Right. But if you do something to help mm -hmm. your children and your grandchildren, mm -hmm. you are actually doing something to help your own genes. Is that right? Yeah, so that's called, that's called inclusive fitness. Okay. Uh, so if you enhance your personal fitness, you can, ha you can have your personal fitness, which is the probability that your genes will be passed on to the next generation. Your inclusive fitness would be the probability that your genes will, as they are passed on through the next set of generations, would be passed on. To so, so this has something to do with why people live beyond the end of reproduction, is because they're still doing things that influence the success of their own genes in future you, generations. If you can enhance the reproduction of your offspring, then you would certainly enhance your fitness indirectly. So Fred, in medical school and actually in any biochemistry course, we're all taught to memorize certain pathways. We memorize mm -hmm. the Krebs cycle, we memorize the clotting cascade, we memorize a bunch of things, and they're all you know, just hard enough to make good exam questions, mm -hmm. with about six or eight or ten things that all have arrows going between them. Are those realistic descriptions of what's actually going on in the body? Uh, they're sort of average and very simplified summaries of what is going on in the body, because it's, it's in, in biochemistry, it's not just a reaction. It's not just turning one chemical into another. Uh, but where the action really is, is in, in the regulation of those pathways. And you are almost never taught that in a biochemistry course. You're, you're taught the diagram, what's called the reaction diagram, right. 
but not the control. As diagram. if it's a bunch of rivers flowing into other rivers or something and without any uh, dams. That's about it, and no, and no, mm. no person operating the sluice gates. Right. Uh, and that is, and that is really where the the interesting things uh, in biochemistry happen is. You know, how do you stabilize these systems? How do you make them happen at the right time? At and the every right single rate? one has to be stabilized. Absolutely. And, every, and they can't all go on at the same time either. They have to be responsive to, to needs from time to time, hour and to hour. And different systems in different cells at different times. Different cells have to be, be doing different things. Otherwise, you know, we, we... So it was bad enough memorizing what you're supposed to memorize. Mm -hmm. um, what if we actually taught people the realities of not just the simple cycle, but 20 things interacting with 20 other things, which I think is a reality for many of these systems. It's a reality for these systems. It's difficult to teach, uh, however, because there's so many of these interactions. And to make it not a road memorization, that, that is really the trick. That doesn't you do know? any good, because you're not going to remember it. But that's how we're teaching biochemistry, is we're, we're, we're teaching it by memorizing the diagram. Whereas we what really would like to do is to, is to know why it does it and how it so if you were to teach evolutionary mm -hmm. biochemistry mm -hmm. and give people a framework for actually mm -hmm. figuring out what this is all about instead of just memorizing stuff, what would you do? Uh, that's, a, that's a really difficult one. And it, the, the, the best source for, for thinking about how to do that would come from comparative biology. Mm -hmm. you know, we, in medical schools, we tend to teach human anatomy, mm -hmm. uh, but we could learn an awful lot about learning the anatomy of, of our nearest relatives or even our most distant, more distant relatives. And, and, and I mean, I love Schmidt Nielsen's you know, work mm -hmm. on different mm -hmm. ways of excreting urea, mm -hmm. depending on whether you're a desert organism or a water mm -hmm. organism, and all these different ways of doing it. And an awful lot of those things in physiology are discovered not in humans, but they're discovered in organisms, animals that live in extreme environments, for instance, where they're really pressed to perform in particular ways. Like the desert around like here. Like the, the desert or the Any or the lizard ocean around here that Arctic. pees a lot? Forget about Peeing it. Peeing a lot, forget it. Not, not a good idea. No. Um, and, and it's by understanding those extreme cases that we can much better understand how these systems operate under what we call more normal. normal so what would you, so you, what you would do to give people a better feeling for biochemistry is to expose them to systems in other organisms and say why they're different. Yeah. And, and one of the, well, one, one thing, again, that we don't learn in biochemistry at all, and that is, for instance, the Krebs cycle um, isn't the same in all organisms, in it's all not. species. They don't all have the same enzymes. Some of them have shortcuts. Some of them don't have those enzymes there at all. Really? Uh, what we're teaching is sort of an average of what happens in rodents, typically, rats and mice. Hmm. Uh, but if we looked at other organisms, the Krebs cycle actually looks quite, looks quite different. I'm amazed. I never knew that. Yeah. And, and then the question becomes now, how do they, how do they manage so well? What yeah. difference did it make? The evolutionary question is, um, how did the current, how, how did our idea well, of the Krebs cycle come well, about? And are those variations products of randomness and you know, it just works well enough? Or has natural selection shaped them? How do we tell? Well, precisely. Um, if we believe in, in robustness, uh, we could think that actually it doesn't matter so much what the exact structure is. Believe of the in robustness. Cycle is. What's robustness? So, robustness is what we were alluding to a, a bit earlier about this relative insensitivity to variation, to variation in environment and variation in genetics, how it is that we can tolerate so many How mutations. health is possible given that we're all genetically How health defective. is possible considering the environment we live in and considering all our, our, our tremendously variable genetic genetic makeup. So this is so central to everything. On the one hand, all of us being relatively stable, and on the other hand, ways that natural selection has of continually purifying out relatively disadvantageous alleles in batches generally. Mm -hmm. And these are the two systems that are really in balance with each other continually to make things work pretty well usually. Pretty, pretty well, and, and that is exactly the, 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 the phrase we need to use in, in, in these systems. They work well enough. Yeah. In other words, evolution doesn't optimize things, it doesn't make things perfect. It works on what's available, and it, it improves it if that variation is available. But by and large, it makes things work well enough given you know, a really lousy toolbox. Yeah. Um, then you watch the Olympics, and all of a sudden you see somebody can do something none of the rest of us can yeah. do. Real outliers. Out There's an outlier, the, the, right, the, the, the right combinations of genes, experience, environment. And practice. And practice. <laughs> Absolutely.